uh, and thank you for coming. Uh, what I'm going to do today is maybe provoke some thinking around um, some relatively recent and about to happen developments merging technology with education. It's very speculative, but I think it's mostly quite achievable quite soon. So we'll see how we go. First of all, I have to explain how I get into this picture. So I've had leadership roles in four medical schools, mostly new in Australia and in uh, the United Kingdom, all focused on new curricula or substantial curriculum change. So I like being in that place where things are changing. It's dynamic, it's exciting, but it's risky. But there's opportunities to do things differently, to realign resources, and then to prove that you, you do the job well. I'm unusually qualified duly in both education and medicine at uh, the highest level. And while I was warned this would destroy my career, it's actually helped make my career, although I'm not what you would call a traditional research-based academic. I wouldn't know test tube, well, a frog. Okay? So my focus has been education and workforce development. I, I like the changing dynamic environment, and I love curriculum design. And I come to curriculum design from the assessment perspective, because I believe quite strongly that if you don't assess it, learners will not learn. So I design a curriculum first, I design an assessment. So today we're going to take a slightly different tack. That's pretty close to where I'm working part-time at the moment up in northwest Queensland. And why I like to show this slide is that first of all, you have to deal with uh, remoteness. And for a long time, I have been a very remote educator in the world. Uh, one of the first um, uh, book chapters I wrote was with then was with uh, nine co-authors, and we were on five continents. This is a while ago now, but I always took the view that location and remoteness shouldn't hold back innovation and disruption, and that's what I've tried to do. And of course, being out there, you never know what's going to hop across the road. You notice the colour of that kangaroo is quite similar to the countryside. These things move fast. But in fact, where I'm working now, there's not just kangaroos, there's cattle, there's camels. There's um, brogas. A broga is a seven foot high crane bird. So there's all sorts of things, and emus. So you have to duck all of those things. So I've learned to be very fleet of foot, able to react quickly in an academic sense. Okay? How I've gone about this is is this. So curriculum design for me has required educational expertise. I'm fortunate I have some of that. I'm not an expert in everything. Uh, but I've been given positions where I can apply my expertise and I recruit well people with particular expertise. Those um, five areas re re from curriculum to accreditation really need expertise. They need to be covered. And um, I've looked around at aligning resources to where we're going to go. Uh, I've, I've always enjoyed uh, encouraging visiting scholars because you get all that expertise for free. You've just got to provide a room. And quite early on in new medical school developments, you have spare rooms. After a while, you have no staff, as you know. And I'm a very learner-centered as well as a very patient-centered doctor. And I've always worked closely with students and tried to build programs that are built around their preferences for learning and their needs. And some of that, I hope, will come through in the rest of the presentation. Now, I'm going to slightly rewrite medical education history here, and I'm, I apologize for everybody I've offended. Firstly, I have left out, th this is a very European view, so I have left out the well-documented records of Chinese medicine and Persian medicine, because I'm focusing on medical education. So the first, the first evidence of European medical education I have found is um, Hippocrates and the Asclepian on the island of Kos in Greece, where people used to go and visit and sit at the feet of the masters to learn how to be a doctor. Now, back then, it was mostly a bit of mysticism, folklore, voodoo, 
um, not an awful lot of what we would call scientific medicine, but they were incredibly good observers of the human condition and some of their original descriptions still make sense in terms of describing conditions. They weren't much good at treating them, but they were good at recognising and, and diagnosing. Um, then there was this period starting with the first medical school in Europe at Salerno in southern Italy. It's been destroyed by an earthquake, several earthquakes, so you can't find it. And then this eventually went up into uh, places like Padova, B Bologna, moved up into Europe. Uh, Oxford was early, um, uh, Prague, Vienna, uh, parts of Germany. Um, and I, so that was a kind of, a, it was getting organised and, and the introduction of European philosophy where it, was, it then became very blurred with religion. All of those European medical schools were actually branches of the, of the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. And you would learn philosophy uh, and, re and uh, religion and medicine together. Fif 15th, 16th century, the age of anatomy, uh, Vesalius, and others uh, doing, doing some rather do dodgy things, um, gaining illegal um, uh, skeletons and uh, bodies for dissection. Um, then there was what I call the, the science and societies, the professional groups, the guilds got going, very protective environment around uh, medical schools, and um, that has continued to the present day, really. And all the way through this, science is increasing, the knowledge base is getting huge um, and what we're now in is what I would call the, an age of technology, particularly with artificial intelligence. Now, there's a lot of misunderstanding around the artificial intelligence. People think this is a thing of the future, but it's not. We've had it for some years already. Um, it is said that most current cars have several onboard computers that can predict. We have cars that park automatically. We have... Um, satellite navigation systems which can predict and guide. So the, uh, the whole concept of artificial intelligence uh, is not new. It's been around for a bit. And in fact, in medical education, our students are using it. And I'll explain what I mean by that. We're not. As usual, we are behind our students in the use of technology. So this is the age, we're at the age of technology where on the right is what people think artificial intelligence looks like. It's a humanoid robot that talks to us and does things. Okay, it doesn't have to be that way, but that, that's what we see. And uh, technology here is developing rapidly. I don't know if anyone's a fan of science fiction movies, but um, uh, there are robots appearing routinely in these dystopian futuristic uh, movies. So it's one called Elysium, where the, um, the parole officer is a robot that looks like a human. There's another one where the social worker look, is a robot that looks like a human. And um, these things are thought to be not too far off. Now, I'm just going to pick on two potential areas which will have an impact in medical or health professional education and I believe will increase the globalisation of health professional education. I'll come back to that. So the first is personalised learning. The second is personalised pastoral care. So artificial intelligence in the curriculum. As I said to you, we're there already. What do I mean by that? Well, our students are on Facebook. Our students communicate with each other. They identify resources. They share them. Um, they might do a lot of this illegally, actually. Intell intellectual property laws have not caught up with, with uh, technology. But there's a lot out there, and students are very good at finding really great resources. So I've learnt a lot from students. So um, probably many of you have seen that um, um, video YouTube video of um, somebody in a white coat acting out an ECG, an arrhythmia. Has anyone seen that one? There's some wonderful resources out there that actually stick in the mind uh, and help students learn. There are amazing resources out there. Um, so this is a multiple choice question. If you had clickers, I'd get you to use clickers. So which of the following is the most correct interpretation of the role of a curriculum? A, a guide to what is taught. B, a guide to what is assessed. A guide to what should be learnt. Or often a distraction for faculty, students and clinicians. So, who votes for number one? Number two? Number three? Number four? Okay, and of course, 
to some extent, all four are correct, aren't they? So that's a trick question. Um, multiple choice questions should never have all of the above or none of the above as a stem, so I didn't do that, but that's what's going on here. So curriculum design is really messy, and uh, the approach we're taking is going to have to change. This is the traditional approach. Um, I like this one, so... Um, We are apprentice to a respected senior person who teaches us. To some extent, this still happens in health professional education. There is an element of apprenticeship. There is an element of, of deep respect for our teachers. That's more so in this part of the world than where I come from. But uh, it's still, nevertheless, a common issue. Um, in Australia, we like students to challenge us more than perhaps is acceptable here because uh, that's, that's the way we feel knowledge advances and people learn. But it's still quite common to see um, apprenticeship with respected senior learners, uh, teachers and clinicians. Um, anyone got an office that looks like this? I have at times. This is part of the knowledge explosion. They're all books. So by definition, every book is out of date before it's published, before it's bought. So the world is moving away from books. There will be a few kind of seminal texts. There'll be updated reference books from time to time. But students no longer like to learn from books anyway. They, they don't want to buy them. They're expensive. They, they're not worth much secondhand. Um, people, students often, at least where I've worked, buy the last edition of the textbook because it's cheap. Um, does it really impact upon their learning? Well, who knows? It, it probably doesn't. Now, two broad approaches. The first one, you control and provide all relevant content to students. And the second one is you just let them go, let them find the information that's out there and focus on assessment. I've already declared my bias. I prefer the second step. You will never be able to control and provide all relevant content to learners. Uh, they're too smart. They, they will pursue content. They will find ways they will find sources. So this is where the TED Talks, Khan Academy, YouTube, etc., as well as um, tutorial Facebook groups, year Facebook groups, all of those sorts of things connect learners in a way that often doesn't include faculty members. I know, I know here at IMU there's a tradition of faculty members being mem uh, members of student groups. That's good where it's, where it's about education. It's not good where it's personal stuff. It's still what happens. So I'm going to take extend number two even further and say, well, is there a way of doing this better? Uh, everyone's now got uh, several mobile devices. I think there have been studies showing that um, in any lecture, probably a third of the students are on Facebook. Um, we think a lot of them are um, on their Facebook tutorial group, uh, but they are communicating with each other about the lecturer and uh, for all I know, you could all be Facebooking each other now saying, God, this guy's boring. Um, let's, let's all walk out the back door. Um, so students do communicate. They, they multitask. There's talk about ADHD being driven by technology in the current generation of um, university students. But um, if you look at virtual reality glasses, anyone here had a go at virtual reality? Yeah, it's, it's rather fascinating and scary, and I don't know how useful it was for me personally, but um, you can certainly... Um, I've gone inside the human body and ridden a red corpuscle around a blood vessel. It was a bit of a ride, uh, but it, it certainly um, was anatomically appropriate, and uh, there was a bit of physiology in there. You could see the oxygen bubbles doing various things around you. So there are these immersive virtual reality environments that not many uni universities can afford to have, but will increasingly become available um, on the web if you've got the right gear. And the price of these things is falling dramatically. That's one model. Uh, you can get the clip-on ones for $10, can't you? So this is what's happening in most medical schools now. Well, I put the learner at the centre because I believe in the learner being at the centre and the learner has access to a whole lot of information, some of which we don't 
as faculty members necessarily know. We certainly don't control. We may not condone or approve. But the learner determines how he or she accesses these, this information. Um, so the Institutional Learning Management System, or VLE, Virtual Learning Environment, is an expensive bit of kit, but in fact, students only use it for part of their uh, learning journey. They, they have all sorts of other things. Now, increasingly, this is going to move. So it's already, whoops, I went backwards. It's already moving to this, where in fact, the mobile devices become the tool to access all that information uh, for the learner. Um, and I, I think that's where many of us are now. Some are more advanced than others, uh, but most of your students here um, have got at least a mobile phone. Many will carry around other things, tablets and computers with them, and this is how you manage learning. So what I'm suggesting is going to happen is that something needs to go in there to help the student work out what they need to know. So here comes a bit of artificial intelligence. Um, he or she looks like a humanoid robot just because that's convenient. But what's going to happen is that all this information will go through a personalised tutor system which is an AI machine, which may not look like that, but could. So this is where this system is going to sift and sort and identify and suggest and prompt and goad and connect and can replace things like the Facebook groups or at least can connect to them, um, can do all sorts of things for learners. off the slide, isn't it? Okay. Hi there, I'm E4PO, your personal tutor. I'm here to uh, guide you through your, uh, to work through this really great but complicated course and become an excellent graduate. So that's what this person says. Um, I like this guy, he's got the same hairdo as me. Of course, all computers really are just black boxes uh, and you, you don't have to have a, a, a physical presence, but you could have a system with a voice or uh, a particular image and avatar and this is the way I see this will work. So the roles will be around storing, analysing information, information, providing access to it. It, it, it will collect assessment results reflections, it'll, it'll use this information, people can fill in all sorts of questionnaires early on about their strengths and weaknesses, um, it'll help search for relevant materials, it can do this 24 hours a day and uh, place things in your inbox when you wake up in the morning, uh, connect you to other learners, uh, both here and anywhere in the world, doesn't really matter and then obviously act as a prompter and a reminder of, of tasks that need to be done. And it's going to have a whole lot of adjustable settings around privacy. You can control, the learner can control who is in their network or networks, can set up lots of groups, um, can modify the search terms. It'll all come with default, defaults, but um, it's a bit like uh, back in the olden days, I, I used to be able to say to the National Mel Medical Health and Research Council, these are the topics I'm interested in, and once a month they'd send me a... a a printout of the relevant new literature. This is going to do this every night or every day in live real time, but you might have to feed in some of the things that you're interested in. It will have a default, default menu related to the curriculum. All the curriculum material will be in this as well. So this is really um, the interface between the learning system and the learner. It's not human. It doesn't really replace human personal tutors, but these personal tutors and mental systems are a bit variable anyway, so I would suggest that there will be still some human mentors, but uh, they will be contacted less often and um, the robots or the AI systems will take over. Um, there will be a threshold for communication with faculty, so where a student is not on track, there's going to have to become some kind of an algorithm that 
communicates with, with the humans to say, hang on, this person is in trouble and I'm not helping. Now, it's going to help keep the assess curriculum aligned with the plan curriculum and as well as the potential curriculum and the delivered curriculum. So this is a slide I use often. Alignment is terribly important. And um, this robot will, this AI system, this personal learning interface will, will ensure that the learner has access to any curriculum material from anywhere in the world that's relevant to that course, okay? and will guide and moderate the assessment as well. Now, because this is Malaysia, the program outcomes have to overlap also and be aligned with the Malaysian Medical Council and the Malaysian Qualifications Agency. But what I'm suggesting here is that um, that's a bad outcome. It's not. What's going to happen here is that um, there will be detailed information in this in this system. I've put up a map of, map of Italy just because I like going to Italy, but there will be very detailed in information in there about content with timing, sequencing, connectivity, lots of different formats, layered learning outcomes from high level to very deep level, all searchable and accessible. These are useful tools which, again, not many institutions have at the moment, um, but this will be a tool for the AI system as well. Then I've just got a few slides about different kinds of curriculum maps. Uh, this information is in there. The more information you can give, the better. And I think learning outcomes by stage and phase is very important. It helps the system know when you're there or when you're not there. And it helps the individual work that out as well. Integration is a good thing. So this is a kind of, there are four domains there of different colours and this reflects a different balance in each year. and and um, um, is, a, is a guide or a map to curriculum. So there's lots of many different kinds of curriculum maps. And of course the principles such as overlapping wedges and spiral curriculum are all very relevant um, and are built into this system, which really is about identifying sources of information, suggesting them to learners at the time that it's relevant and necessary and providing help. And where I think this will go is that, I, I didn't put the words in, but there are program outcomes there. And it's particularly relevant to a, an institution like IMU, which has partner schools for several professions. Because I think increasingly, with students from all countries being able to access all of the same information, medical schools are going to become not the arbiters of the content. And indeed, maybe the regulators will not become the arbiters of content the universities will be the providers, the arrangers, the organisers, the guides for students to learn, not, not the determinants of the content. And probably we'll see much closer alignment between the content required by all of the regulating agencies around the world. So, and another hat I've got, I've done work with the GMC, the AMC, the World Federation of Medical Education, the Irish Medical Council and the LCME in, in North America. And from what I can see, the curricula for medical schools around the world, I have to talk about medicine for a bit, other professions may have great differences, but in medical schools, the curricula requirements are very, very similar. The content is the same. There's some local adaptation. So things like my area of rural medicine, that differs most more than, than uh, other areas. General practice differs more because the health systems are different around the world, but the pathology is the same, anatomy is the same. So largely, I think we're going to see a, a greater globalisation and a commonality of content of programs across the world. Now, you're going to say you can't unclog a curriculum, this robot won't be able to work, you're just going to add time. Well, I just want to give an example from the University of Tasmania where we unclogged the curriculum by 20%. So three years ago, we deliberately cut 20 to 25% of lectures. I have to say that the staff were not keen on this. They thought they were failing in their duty by cutting lectures. But what we did is we replaced the lectures with more online resources and allowed the students more time to choose what they did. And what we found was that academic outcomes were not affected by the cut before and after. 
you can see the scores were not significantly different. And not only that, it didn't affect the progression rates. And there were some years of data involved with this. Uh, this was presented at APMEC this year and then the paper for publication is, is on the way. Uh, but it's just very interesting to see that, in fact, you can cut what you deliver face to face by lectures, increase the support resources around it, and at least have no negative impact on student learning, which is what the faculty were worried about. So that's the first topic, that's AI in a curriculum design. And um, I think we've got to go for pastoral care as well, because uh, there's a great uh, problem in medical education around the world um, and in university education. Uh, we're finding that um, students are under a lot of uh, stress. There's a lot less certainty around careers. Um, there seems to be a lot of pressure. We're worried in some countries about high uh, depression and suicide rates. So what are we going to do about it? Universities, at least in Australia and the United Kingdom, I know them best, uh, and I know in America, they are not immune from this. Students want better support. Um, and how do we do that? So, enter another artificial intelligence system. I've given this one a kindly little face just because, well, he's cute really, isn't he? And I, I think if you're going to go to a, a counsellor, you want the counsellor to, to look friendly and happy and helpful, okay? So this is a personal mentor here to help you stay healthy so you enjoy the course. You can tell me anything. I'll keep this confidential unless I think your health is at risk. We've come to that. The threshold for passing on information is one of the key areas here, just as the privacy settings on Facebook are very important. So what we're going to do here is... Um, at the moment, learners have access to a whole lot of things for support. Now, um, you'll notice that faculty is only one of them. So I, I, I don't want to, I apologize for having to break you the bad news. We are not the most important central thing in students' lives. Okay? They have help from all sorts of other things. They get harassment from email as well. Um, we, we, we mark them on attendance. Social media is a major cause of concern and stress for uh, young people. Not for me, I'm not on it. Um, I don't want to know what people think about me. Um, family and friends, so uh, again, the learner is in the middle and they not quite sure what to do with all this information. A lot of it overlaps, it conflicts. Um, you can get a lot of pressure and negativity at a time you've got to focus and study. You may not be sure you really want to do the course you're doing. Where do you get help from? Well, uh, a similar model. Um, we have this little uh, black box that's got a friendly, cute face that sorts all this information out for you, learns from patterns, and gives you feedback and advice. Um, mental health advice uh, in health apps around the world, one of the most successful uh, areas is mental health. So there's all sorts of little um, uh, mind games, mindfulness exercises, uh, cognitive behaviour therapy, all sorts of things. You can administer uh, depression scales uh, through these machines and give people a really good idea of, of, well, the machine would gain a really good idea of how people are progressing and managing. So if if this little robot is constantly in touch with, with a student, and remember, each student has their own, okay? They might even be able to choose a different looking one or a different avatar or a different name. Uh, so they have a personal mentor. But this person will, will be able to pick up uh, what's going on. And I've mentioned health apps. So a lot of students these days wear electronic watches which are measuring all sorts of things. And I think increasingly, just as in primary care, we're talking about using this data to monitor patients with long-term problems. More and more of this is going to be helpful in terms of managing the physical and mental well-being of our students. And it doesn't get fed into me as a faculty member or a dean. It goes to the machine, which then sorts it out, learns about you. And remember, this personal mentor stays with you for the whole time you're a university student. So if it's a long program like medicine, which is five years, 
you have the same personal mentor who remembers what you were like when you first joined and will see you develop. Now, some of the algorithms have got to be developed. Uh, remember, I'm not a technician, but the concept, I think, is quite straightforward. So this is the little uh, bot. Again, it's these things store vast amounts of information and can sift and analyze patterns. That's what it's about. Um, they can monitor mood and anxiety levels, suggest support apps, refer you to a counselor, um, communicate regularly. Hi, how are you going? Um, a lot of students report a relatively lonely life where nobody actually asks them how they're going. Um, they'll be able to ad adjust privacy settings and thresholds perhaps. The threshold for reporting concerns is a significant issue. Quite clearly there'd have to be some something developed around that area because we, we don't want you know um, this thing reporting personal information unless there's serious cause for concern. So there's a bit of work to be done around that. Now the obvious question I can see that you've got in your head are um, D4PO and E3D4 going to connect? And what's the right answer? No, unless there is a serious concern. So you can see that the guy on the left, the academic tutor, personal tutor, probably does need to be sending information in because the personal mentor is going to need information that knows that the student is coping well or doing, doing well or not but you don't want the communication to go the other way. The most likely place for the, uh, the bot on the right to communicate is with a human being around serious concerns um, of the mental health, probably. So in the age of uh, privacy breaching, um, I personally find it quite disturbing that information can be leaked and, and breached and sent all over the world. But it does surprise me endlessly that young people don't seem to mind doing this. So I, I'm not too sure there would be as much resistance to this amongst the, the generation coming into universities as amongst my generation. I wouldn't want to do this, but I think that if students are already doing this or things very like this, and if this was well designed and the design included some students, of course, to make it useful for them. There may be other functions that I haven't thought of that can be built in. So I think what we can say in summary is that artificial intelligence is actually here already and it has the potential to further add value to learning and pastoral care support systems. I'm worried that the technicians are going to design it. You know, it's people like us who need to be in there saying this is the sort of thing we need. Students need to be in there as well. These are the sorts of things that work. So we need to be involved with the design briefs. I actually don't think it's going to replace us. We all worry about that, but as I was driving on the, on the green line on Sunday where there were no humans anywhere near the, the trains underground here in KL, um, it's interesting that it, it's, it seems to be the jobs that don't require a lot of complex judgment, which are most at risk with mechanization and artificial intelligence. And I'd like to think that academics in universities have to make a lot of complex judgments. So I'm not sure that this is going to replace us too much. Um, and it's likely to result in a more global approach because every student in every medical school can access the same information as every other student in every other medical school. It's up to how it's organized, arranged and supported that will make the difference. This is a job which is at high risk of being replaced. So a lot of the movies have robocops and uh, this is a security person. So there are probably no security people in the room, but it's the security people um, who are, are going to lose their jobs well before academics because in fact they're better. They've, they've got these high resolution cameras and they can detect movement and they don't get bored, they don't go to sleep like I would if I was sitting at a security desk. 
So that's it. Thank you very much for coming. I hope I've sort of provoked a bit of thinking. This is already happening, and I don't think this is too far in the future. But it's up to us to design it and to make it happen. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you. It's just one of my favourite Aboriginal paintings on my wall at home. Yep. I did an academic, academic um, AI tutor or the pastoral care mentor would do. Would, would you think that this would affect the student's own ability or developing their own ability to look at all this material and make decisions? Would that ha affect that? That you have someone now to... I was just thinking that almost like it's like having a nanny. When you're a child and you have a nanny and, and now that you are in university and you are going to the workplace, would it mean that you still always need someone to guide when we used to make that decision ourselves? We learned it. We took information and we just just thinking in that perspective. Yeah, that is a very good question. Um, we don't want to create further dependency, do we? Yeah. So now I, I think there's scope here to build in some um, coaching. So you give the most support for beginning students, and for senior students, you might the, the machine might be prompted to say, "Well, what do you think you should do? What are the options? What feels right for you?" and to step in only if it sensed that there was a serious mental health or a risk of, of serious depression or suicide or, or something. Um, and I, I, th I think that's probably relatively easy to build in. Again, I'm not a software engineer, but um, they seem to do it in the movies, all right. Build in um, an element where the threshold for being directly involved will rise with time. Because what you'd want to do is to build resilience one of the greatest concerns about students at the moment is that they're not so resilient. And um, parents are being blamed for driving their kids to school and making sure they've got everything that they need. Never saying no, apparently. So it, it's easy to blame parents, but I think we're in a system which is complicated. So you would, you would have to say that if you're 18 and going to university, you are an adult, you're expected to become self-managing. Um, but you would start off with a more supportive system and just gradually retract and, and build in a coaching service. Thanks, <coughs> Thanks Richard. Um, just it brings me back to a paper I read about, you know, the domestic um, interactive system, Alexa, where flush the toilet, make the tea, yada, yada, yada. They're now adding on resources to that. You can add it. Yeah, on the TV ad, it says how many stars are there in the galaxy and so forth. But you can now add on resources which include academic notes. So as you're walking around the house, you can do Q&A with this, and it can tell you facts, and you can question it. So it's already happening, I guess, and the technology is there. Yes, I agree with you. I've also, um, at a recent um, accreditation visit to Curtin Medical School in Perth, I just can't remember the name of the software program, but there's a new program which is like Facebook for med students, developed by some ex-med students in America, which is available quite cheaply apparently. And it is already doing some of these functions uh, in terms of gathering information, prompting you with, with questions and answers, um, has a huge bank of formative assessment questions. Um, and it, it's available for medical schools to buy now quite cheaply. And what happens at Curtin is the students drive it with the help of the education office but it's the students who are the people who monitor it and, and run it and feed the information in. So um, I, I think that it won't be long before a lot of these programs are going to be uh, able to be available. And there's no reason why Google Home or any of these things can't do similar functions. All you've got to do is plug in the module on, on um, Question Bank for semester one, uh, which must be easy to do. And uh, you, can, you can revise as you do the vacuuming. I, you know, not too sure. Revise as you have a shower. The world is a different... I don't know that I want to revise when I'm having a shower, but I think the option will be there. And I think we already know that when's the peak time that our students are on the internet? It, 
it's not 8 p.m. at night, it's midnight to 2 a.m. Um, they, they learn in a very different way. Um, I started using Kahoot a lot for answering my students' questions. So when you do Kahoot, you know that they've learnt it, but you, don't, you miss out that have they understood it, that eureka moment that you see on their face when you're in a room with them, you don't know if they get that. Yes, yes, but um, facial recognition in software is getting very good, isn't it? And um, already it is said that um, if, we, if we take a picture of you and feed it into the computer and connect it to every closed circuit TV camera in KL, we can track you 24 hours a day and we can probably read what you're thinking. Yeah, very distressing, but yes. Yes, there's a shopping centre in Sydney at the moment that's got a, a, a booth where you go in and it looks at your face and it tells you everything you didn't want to know about yourself plus more. And apparently it's reasonably accurate. Uh, it can tell your temperament and your interests and your hobbies. And yeah, I, I don't know, this is just guesswork or what, but so far it seems to be working. Hi, Prof. Uh, my question is in similar lines. I was wondering the mentor robo, how it will be able to read the cues of the students. It's not just hearing what they are saying. Most of the times we respond to their body language and things which they are not saying, which we read. So how can this be effectively done with a robot? I think the students will be, again, it's a great question and I don't know, but I think the students will be in front of a camera. I mean, how many computers and phones now do not have a camera? I'm told you can turn them on remotely. Uh, it's quite scary. Um, I recently received a text uh, on my phone telling me that they had captured a photo of me doing something I wouldn't want my friends to see. Um, here's a bank account, put a thousand US dollars in there right now. Now, I knew, I knew that it couldn't possibly be right because the phone had been sitting in a box for a week, um, turned off. But these scams work and apparently it's technically possible to turn everything on remotely and, and take film. So it's a question of would you build in a threshold if, if the bot was worried about you, you know, th there's an algorithm to write, would it then turn on the video when you're talking to it in a computer? Um, I, I th again, I think there are probably interesting ways of getting around this and this facial recognition and, and reading of mood and emotion type stuff uh, would be there. Uh, Prof, when we talk about technology, I think uh, we associate it with cost. How much is it going to cost? How much is it going to be so costly that we cannot afford it? Yeah, another great question. So um, initially the cost will be high, always is, but um, it'll fall rapidly. So what we need is a few philanthropists um, you know, they, I just heard that the founder of Microsoft died today, but he had given two million to, two billion, sorry, to, to scientific discovery. And all we need is um, Alan, not Bill Gates, it was Alan. Um, uh, all we need is somebody to, to actually kickstart this. And the, the costs would, would plummet. Um, look, look at what happens in cars. Ten years ago, to get a computer in your car, you had to buy the top of the range model. These days, they all come out with, with most of the software. And it's actually cheaper them to make it for every car than to have some cars with it and some cars without it. So I think there will be a very steep drop in price, but the development costs are probably going to be relatively high. I know that doesn't answer your question directly in a time frame, but somebody will do this. Because we had the workshop on case-based learning and some of our colleagues from Monash, Malaysia had come for the workshop and they were mentioning that in the new curriculum that they have, one of the challenges is the students in Australia want more time 
less time at the university because they want to actually have time to pay for their education. That means they want to work and pay for their education. So the semesters are being short. It, it relates to curriculum design and perhaps to cost because the cost is also for the students who are paying the fees. So what would the challenge be in terms like, for example, if students need to do two things, three things, and manage that medical education, earn some money and do that, would also curriculum design take into this consideration that if you move away things from uh, the classroom, so the knowledge bits, but they come to for the hospital attachments, the community attachments, but other things, giving them free time, and if they pass the assessment, then why not? And any comment on that? Yeah. Yes. Um, again, very good points in education. So I, I think many students join uh, learn from small group interaction. Not everybody does, uh, but already students are. Uh, if they're at an institution which uh, records all lectures, and this is now the norm in at least Australia and the United Kingdom, we're, we're required to uh, record everything. So it becomes a podcast. And um, the evidence so far is that students do watch podcasts. They watch them more than once. Uh, they're useful for revision, but they do watch them early on. So I think that um, lectures will be one of the resources that's plugged into the AI system. And it, it could be that people like us give our lectures to an empty room. Um, and maybe last year's lecture's good for two or three years, we don't have to redo it. Uh, so we have more time to do other things, like research and faculty development and maybe some of the more interactive stuff. It's difficult to, to not make clinical skills sessions, um, simulated patient sessions and placements mandatory. But I, I think that this system could be used from home. And if you're talking about multi-site video conferencing group work, which is possible now and will only get easier and better, um, I, I don't see why we can't go along with that change and have, have on-site attendance fall. I mean, quite frankly, coming coming to IMU every day must be very difficult in terms of traffic. And it's like that in any big city. So wouldn't it be better to just, you know, you, you wouldn't have to worry about adding another lecture room. You just bung people together electronically. And, uh, you know, the, the key bit about a lecture is not actually the lecture. It's not the talking part. It's the question and answer afterwards. And I think that's the bit we haven't quite got, wo got working properly yet with technology. Um, every time I'm on a multi-site teleconference, several bits fall over. We have people talking over each other. But I, I think technology will get better. Does this mean we'll have to abolish the concept of completing your degree within a certain time frame? Well, why not? Uh, I think the professional courses have problems with that. but I, I, I think that's actually quite a good idea at the front end of, again, I'll talk about medicine programs. I think the last couple of years are very difficult to make part-time, but I don't see why we can't allow people to do the first two and a half years of your program at a different rate, either faster or slower, depending on their needs and their preferences. Um, you know, there, there are some implications for what fees you would charge <coughs> them for what. But I think the concept of completing as you uh, as you master the material is very doable with this method. It's it's already happening in A level. Students here are not going to school anymore. They're going to tuition centres, and they just register for the next available or even two available A levels, and that they're not in any formal education at all. So can you see that model extending to university, where like in some Italian universities, you can choose when to sit your exams? Yes. I think these things are going to come. They're going to be quite uncomfortable for us. Um, I wouldn't like to see cram schools set up to, to necessarily get you through your medical program in th six months instead of two and a half years. But, you know, I, I think the concept of, of allowing people a bit more freedom about when and how they attend and what they do, with everything being online and available in, a, in, a, in an accessible format that, that's highly organised and personalised to the student, is not a bad model. I'm not quite sure how it'll work. That's all. Any more questions? 
Okay, if not, we thank um, Prof. Richard in the usual way.